I am absolutely delighted to uh, introduce Alex Hughes. Um, he's a friend to many of us already. Um, Alex is a postdoc uh, here at the school. He has been teaching in MIDS for how long now? I was just doing the math with Mike. I think this is my ninth semester. Okay, for nine semesters. He's one of our longest standing um, instructors. Uh, he got his PhD in 2016 from UC San Diego. Um, in political science, and he studied political science also at the University of Michigan, um, where he has yeah. a BA uh, also in econometrics. Um, his work looks at how identity shapes access and behavior in politics. Often the work takes um, the form of, of experiments, um, and he's published very widely in um, political science and policy journals. Uh, he teaches, the course that he teaches for MIDS is a um, called Experiments and Causal Inference, and he has become well known in the MIDS program as an outstanding instructor. I just went and tapped some of the quotes. I won't bore you with too many, but um, here's one quote from the, just the past, hot off the press the past semester. It says, I'm sure you heard that Alex is amazing, and he is. He's exceptional at engaging students in his class and exciting them about the content in ways that I don't see in other courses. And he reinforces that in ways in different channels live, Slack, Slack individual, uh, office hours, etc. This was not originally on my list of classes to take, but missing this would have been a big mistake. And then, this is the best MIDS course I've taken so far. All right. I'll turn it over to you now. So maybe that's a good lead in. This is, um, this is an experiment that I ran with uh, colleagues at University of Georgia and University of Michigan, and uh, three MIDS students who uh, the third of the students, Diana, she's going to be graduating in the graduation that we have this weekend. Uh, Guillermo graduated three, two semesters ago, and Natarajan graduated three semesters ago. So this is, um, this is an experiment that we ran in the 2016 general election, the election that was between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And what we wanted to know was if the um, identity of an individual who wanted to vote shape the way that that individual was treated by our electoral system. There's a pretty clear norm that people who are citizens who have access to vote should be treated equivalently in the front, in the eyes of the system. Um, but there's research coming out in a number of different places, um, research in housing projects, research in um, unemployment benefits, research in electoral uh, discrimination from 2000 and the 2014 election that suggests that maybe that might not be the case. So we're gonna look at this again to evaluate whether or not there's discrimination among local elections officials. And the, the punchline that we're going to find is that yes, there is. So as a motivation here, participation by individuals in electoral politics, there's like a long history of this. This is the bread and butter in political science. And we sort of think that there are two, at least probably three things that were categories that we might think of as driving people voting. Individual characteristics might drive people to vote. Uh, this is old school political science. You're, how old you are? Do you have a degree? What sort of income do you have? Uh, who are your friends? These drive people to go and vote. So to do social characteristics, this is a newer wave, um, maybe, maybe best represented most recently um, in a 2010 Nature article by Bond et al. Uh, where they were working on Facebook and they were showing individuals that their friends had gone to vote and measuring the uptick in uh, the vote that they took. Um, these social characteristics, but also information access, since we're here in a data science program in the iSchool. Access to information about where you vote is a necessary condition to be able to go and vote. And we're gonna really work on this information access part of it here. There's also evidence, a lot of evidence, that individual characteristics or individual group identity shapes institutional access. So here, uh, federal program access like uh, social security, as well as wait time in minority precincts. These are voting precincts in the 2010 election in precincts which are more, have greater proportion of minority voters. The resource allocation is lower, generating longer wait times compared to uh, generally whiter precincts. So the, the research question, we sort of boil it down into four research questions for the purposes of the talk. The first one, do institutions treat minorities differently than majorities? Uh, second, are minority classes, uh, because we're going to identify three different classes of minorities, Latinos, Blacks, and Arabs, are they treated equivalently? Are they treated differently within the minority category? 
Third, are minorities treated differently in areas that are or were covered by the 1965 VRA? So we'll jump into this a little bit. The VR Voting Rights Act was passed in response to discriminatory voting practices in the South. It, uh, there were a sort of a spate of provisions. Some of them were recently repealed, and so we get to measure differential responsiveness in these areas. And the fourth is what role, if any, does politics play in the responsiveness? Um, to keep from bearing the lead here, we, we find pretty clear evidence of discrimination against minority voters. So we find, first of all, that street-level bureaucrats, these are the people who are fielding questions from voters, uh, they're responding considerably less frequently when minorities are asking the questions than when whites are asking the questions. Um, within the minority class, though, it's not an equivalent discriminatory practice. Instead, we're finding that there's no evidence of differential treatment of blacks versus whites. Though there is evidence of, strong evidence of uh, Arab names being treated much worse than uh, white voters. So here, the, the plot at the bottom, uh, people with Arab names were responded to and given information, 14 percentage point lower rate, at a 14 percentage point lower rate than were whites. Um, and then the fourth of these that we find is that districts that broke Republican uh, in the 2016 election, they are uh, sort of hands and feet more discriminatory against Arab voters than against other voters. And we've got stories about why we think that's the case. Now, the difference between the study we're performing here and, and several past studies is that we're exogenously varying the names of the people who are sending these requests. So for example, the King 2010 study, which looked at minority precincts, I guess majority minority precincts, mostly black precincts versus mostly white precincts, those weren't, those weren't randomly assigned. And so there are other characteristics associated with the differences in these precincts that may also be contributing to differences in behavior. It may be that in majority minority precincts, black precincts, that there's just less resource available and so they could not allocate as much. So the discriminatory behavior, the dis pattern of discriminatory behavior could actually be discriminatory or it could just be unlucky. It could be a resource allocation problem. And the way that we would solve these would be different if it were a resource allocation problem versus explicit discrimination. Because of the way that we've set this up, we're able to make really clear claims that it is discriminatory practices or bias practices rather than some other feature. Uh, in the next maybe five minutes, I'll run through how we set it up and how we came to these answers. So who are we dealing with? These street level bureaucrats that we're talking with. These are the mostly apolitical bureaucratic officials who are responsible for the conduct of our elections. Uh, these folks are not making laws, they're interpreting laws and applying them. These are the folks, if you moved from Alameda up to Martinez, right, if you switched counties and you weren't sure where your precinct was, probably the first thing you would do is you would look on the internet you would see that the websites are a mess because there's just not much attention paid to them. And then you'd start emailing or calling people, right? It would be this person who would pick up your email or your phone call. There are about 6,000 of these individuals, 6,500 or so that we deal with. The entire population in the US of these individuals is about 7,500. We drop 1,000 of them for reasons we could talk about. Uh, so these folks are directly interacting with citizens. They have discretion over how they're going to respond. Maybe I pick up the phone, maybe I do not pick up the phone, maybe I respond to the email, maybe I don't respond to the email. Maybe I do an extensive search to figure out uh, where this is supposed to be, or maybe I just give a pro forma response. Um, and these individuals have a widely varied method of appointment. In some places, these people are the comptrollers of the city. In other places, they are the dog catcher. In other places, they are politically appointed um, and they stand only to execute these elections. Um, the design, our experiment design is a between subject design. So to each of these individuals, these 6,500 individuals, we're gonna send one piece of contact. This piece of contact um, is gonna come from one of four different ethnicity primes, where the ethnicity primes come from the class of white, of black, of Latino, and of Arab. The way that we're gonna manipulate these primes is through the name that signs an email. So in the names that come from a white prime, we're gonna pick from a list of, it's a census list of names that are identified as being white, non-Hispanic. We're gonna pick 100 different names from that list and sign emails with those names. For Latino names, we're gonna take New York census data of Latino names. We're gonna sign from 100 of these individuals. For black names, we're gonna pull from a list of, by Friar and Levitt, 
you might remember them from maybe Freakonomics fame. This is a list of, uh, like a taxonomical list of black names that are indicative of being black and not other uh, ethnicities or races, and of Arab names where we're pulling from another source. So we've got 400 different names that we're pulling from, and we're gonna send a piece of contact to our registrars, to our local elections officials that look like this. Dear, whatever his or her name is, uh, we send a sentence which is a preamble, we ask a question about what I need to bring to vote and if it affects me in the state that I live in. And we say thank you, and the randomized component, that's the only thing that's systematically different between the contact we're sending is who it is which is signing the, that is signing the, signing the email. The preamble text looks like this. We've got three different categories. We're randomly drawing from bins in these categories. So for example, it might read like this, Dear John Adams, if that were the name of the local elections official, I've been hearing quite a bit about identification rules on the news. Do these changes affect California? I was wondering what I need to bring with me to vote. Thank you, my name. The combination of the three different draws that gives us like a permuted set of 27 different treatments that we can send that are, are more or less the same. If we look through the text that's here, inside of each of the categories, there's not much that's dis distinguishing any one of the sentences. That combined with the 400 names gives us about 5,000 unique treatments that we're sending to people, where the only thing that's systematically related to this is the ethnicity of the sender. After we sort of think about scheming this out in the design, there's the execution of it, which um, was sort of non-trivial perhaps. It wasn't actually that hard. So we start with uh, dealing with the uh, census API. We're pulling information about geographies. Uh, how many people live in the area? What is the median income in the area? What is the proportion uh, minority in the area? We merge that onto um, a population list of our subjects. So these are all of the registrars in the country. Turns out that though this is a publicly appointed position, there is no list of these individuals, nor is there any common web page. Missouri looks very different than Michigan, looks very different than Montana. Um, and some states don't actually provide contact information for these local elections officials, so you could not contact them if you wanted to. Uh, after we scrape these and clean them up, we're taking just the names and the emails from these. This is how we're going to contact individuals. We're merging that together with the population study we pulled from the Census API. And then on the other side, we're sort of iterating through the design and the treatment materials that we're gonna send. So here we're looping through Mechanical Turk. We're making sure that the names that we're sending are sensible, that they're priming ethnicities as we think they should, uh, as well as that the treatment language and the names are being scored as being no different in their appropriateness or their reasonableness or politeness. So we're making sure that the only thing different is the names. We're taking this, we're feeding it into a randomization where we have built a, like a, essentially we built our own uh, web server for sending these messages off of easywebmail.com. We contact the 6,500 individuals. Uh, we did some of the engineering and the headers of the emails and the permissioning of the emails so that we know if they've opened the emails. We also know when they respond and to whom they respond. It comes to the county registrars. They make the two choices. Number one, do I open this? Number two, do I respond to this? And these are the two that we're gonna focus on. There's a third, which is sort of down the path, which is what do I respond? What do I say in the content of these? And this is interesting from a, like a descriptive point, but it's not really, it, well, it's actually very poorly causally identified. Um, so we're gonna not deal with that for this paper here. Responses come back, we database them, uh, we run the analysis and we report back out on them. Um, if you want, I can share back out the notebook that lays behind this to make sure that I'm not missing something here. Let's jump into the results quickly. So responses per state. On the, on the x-axis here, we have the response rate. And on the y-axis, we have a count of the number of times that we saw that. So the response rate was about 65% on average, which suggests to us that uh, the registrars, the local elections officials are taking this contact seriously. 65% of the emails we sent receive a response. When I talked with people who are in uh, direct mail firms, uh, typically email firms are getting back like a half of a percent response or a 1% response. So when we got 65%, uh, actually one of our students, Chris Bennett, uh, was floored. He said, I should quit and I should be emailing these people. Counting the responses per state on the right-hand panel here, um, two states on the right-hand tail of this, this is on a logged axis, uh, Michigan and Wisconsin have a crazy, they have a, a system which has uh, 1,400 registrars in Michigan and 1,200 registrars in Wisconsin compared to the overall body, which is what, 6,500 that we sent out. So 
those two on the far right are the largest states that we sent to. The smallest states that we sent to are Alaska and Hawaii. Hawaii has one registrar per island. And actually, they don't have a different email address. It just goes into one person, and then they send it to other places. So we actually excluded Hawaii from the study here. Given the setup where we are randomly varying the contact that individuals receive, the estimators of our effect are actually really straightforward. It's just a difference in means and the response rates between the different treatment groups. So on the top line here, we can come up with an estimate for the treatment effect overall of whites versus minorities. So this is the average response rate given that you received a white contact versus the average response rate given that you received a minority contact. And this is going to give us causal information. This is going to tell us about in the future, what do we think the difference would be if I change a person's name from this to that or the person's ethnicity from this to that. We can break it down further and we can look at whites versus Latinos, whites versus black, and whites versus Arabs in the same way because all of these are randomly assigned. We've seen this already. Here are the, here are the point estimates for the causal effect here. Uh, Latinos are being responded to at about 3.2% percentage points lower rate. So whites are receiving responses about 65% of the time that they send a request, whereas Latino senders are receiving a response rate about 62% of the time. Blacks are being responded to equivalently. And Arab senders are receiving responses uh, just over half of the time that they send them compared to the 62% of whites. So this is a 14% or so decrease in the responsiveness if you have an Arab name. Uh, I'm going to skip the math here. But what we can do, there was, a, there was a study which was conducted in the 2014 election that was written up in the American Political Science Review. They ran a really similar design to us using only Latino names. And so we can combine together their results with our results to make a statement about how much is the effect for Latino names across these two studies. And this, this also has causal characteristics. So in the 2012 study, there was about a 4% discriminatory, 4 percentage point discriminatory penalty paid by Latinos. In the 2016 election, we come up with about a 3%. And so the weighted average combining these two together, we're coming up with about a 4% weighted average for being Latino in the long run. What about the open rates, though? Right. So the one of the responses that we cared about was, do we get an email back? Are there differences in the rates at which people open these emails? So the way that we constructed it, the name on the envelope of the email, the envelope address, was the first letter and then the last name of the individual, and then two digits afterwards. So it would have been like A Hughes 32 or D Paul in 24. So the, the local elections officials are receiving a little bit of information about the ethnicity of the person, though they're not receiving any content internal to it. So when we look at uh, white versus Latino versus black versus Arab, you can already see that there's a penalty being paid by Arab senders before they know the content internal to the, to the, uh, to the email. Um, this is sort of neither here nor there, but is my frustration with the system. So this is, uh, this is Bounce Rage. This is the, the site. We scraped the email addresses and cleaned the email addresses uh, five days before we sent them, which was eight days before the election. So this is 13 days prior to the election. And um, you know, roughly 4% of the emails bounced because they were incorrect. So if you had wanted to contact your uh, local elections official, you would not have been able to for lackadaisical or problems. We looked into it. Uh, it was not our scraper that was leading to these bounces. So answers to two questions here. Does being a minority cause one to receive differential treatment? Yes, we have the evidence of that so far. Are minority classes treated equally, Latino, blacks, and Arabs? No. Latinos are paying a price that blacks are not. Arabs are paying uh, roughly a three times greater price. Was the effect of being a minority different in those areas that were previously covered by the Voting Rights Act? So the Voting Rights Act, remember, was uh, written to cover discriminatory, legacy discriminatory practices. In particular, Section 5 of the VRA was a preclearance requirement. So in these areas, uh, mostly in the South, also in Michigan where I grew up, a couple of counties, uh, if there was going to be any change to the voting rules, they had to be pre-cleared by the Department of Justice. This is, this is uh, constitutionally, it's a big move because elections are to be conducted by the states. And this was a federal incursion into this. The courts upheld this incursion for a long time, saying, well, there was extraordinary circumstances of discrimination meriting this extraordinary incursion. Uh, this was stricken down in 2015, Shelby County, 2015, 
where the court said there's no longer the presence of this sort of extraordinary problem, so we're going to take out the Section 5 preclearance coverage. We can evaluate whether or not there is a difference in the discriminatory practices here, and we actually don't find any at this point. So as the courts found that there is not, uh, you know, we're actually, we don't have any evidence to the contrary of that. So we'll, we'll look at it in three ways. Number one is voter ID laws. Number two is Section 5 preclearance coverage. And then the third of these is another VRA provision, which is a minority language provision. Uh, in a district, if a certain proportion of your population is non-English native speaking, and they do not have a certain level of education, high school graduation, uh, then you have to provide election materials in the language which is the predominant language. So in Chula Vista in San Diego where I was before, they were covered by Section 203 because there was a large population of uh, foreign-born Spanish speakers uh, who had become citizens and who were eligible to vote. Um, in brief, there's, there's not much evidence to support this place-based or uh, VRA-based difference in discrimination. So what's, what's the estimation strategy here? The estimation strategy is going to be, did we get a response or not get a response? Conditional on the treatment that we sent, that's beta 1. The identification rules or the VRA rules in the area, that's beta 2. And then we're looking for heterogeneity on the third of these. If we should find heterogeneity on the third of these, it would be evidence that the prime is working differently in places that are under different uh, ID laws or different VRA laws. So here I'm reporting, these are actually one, two, three, this is 12 different models that are there. Um, and I'm only reporting the interaction on the models. This is bad stats, but it's evidence that there's just nothing moving in here on differences in discrimination based on the IDs. We have maybe one result here, which we might call a result that looks like it holds, but we've just run 12 different tests. And so I don't, I don't believe that this is a, a true result. This is a false positive. What about for voting rights coverage? So this is section five, this is the preclearance requirement. Uh, we find that in areas that were covered under preclearance in the past, there's actually a 10% increase in the responsiveness overall. Now think, think about what's, what this is. Areas that were covered under VRA uh, were typically southern areas. And they had, as a consequence of VRA, they have systematized responses. They have like form emails and clear responses to send to. So that we have a 10% higher response rate here, I think is evidence of the, the success of forming up clear expectations around these institutions. In the second models, let's see. Actually, in the first model here, we'll, we'll stick with the first one over here. The first model, there's no evidence of a difference in the response rate when you were a minority versus not a minority, meaning that overall, these places are responding 10% more frequently, and they're treating minorities no differently. Mm. Let me say that carefully. They're treating minorities, the, resp <laughs> the treatment effect is no different against minorities in the areas that were covered by Section 5 versus not. The discrimination continues to exist at the same rates, but it's not worse or better. Um, we can look at the same models sort of broken out by different minority categories here, classes, uh, and we're finding a similar response. The, the discrimination continues to exist, but it is not sort of marginally different in these areas. VRA coverage, um, I'm going to skip through this quickly, though. The VRA preclearance coverage is also a proxy. The 20th, Section 203 language requirement is a proxy for minority population. So we're looking specifically at Spanish-speaking areas. In the Spanish-speaking areas, response rates to Latinos was notably higher than in other areas. And this probably seems reasonable. Um, we're going to deal with that population based in a, in, a, in a clearer way in just a moment, though. So the, the fourth of these questions we wanted to look at is, uh, what is the role of politics? What is the role of politics in shaping the responsiveness to these uh, queries? And we're going to look at the role of politics in the following way. We're going to take the same models we, that we've been estimating to this point, and we're going to look at differences in how Republican or Democratic the vote share went in the 2016 election. So we're going to say, what was the response rate, differential response rate to minorities versus whites? And then in this third term here, we're going to look for, was that response rate, uh, was the discrimination penalty higher or lower conditional on how Republican the area was or how Democratic the area was? 
Uh, the headline effect is yes, it, it, it's really clearly against Arabs. So this is the same class of models as we were estimating previously. Um, showing models and talking about them on a screen in a presentation is a bad idea. So let me show what drops out of this model in a way that makes sense. So here, on the x-axis, this is the Republican vote share ranging from 0% Republican, a district where Hillary Clinton won every vote, to 100% Republican, a district where Donald Trump won every vote. Um, on the rug plot down here, this is, the, this is just a one-dimensional histogram. This is showing our data coverage across the entire axis, or you can see it as a density plot here. Here's the response rate to white senders conditional on how Republican or Democratic the area was. There's, there's essentially no effect. This is, this is indistinguishable from a flat line across that they're receiving responses that are about 65% of the time. However, for the Arab cues, in a highly Democratic district, there's no difference in the response rate. They're both being responded to roughly 60% of the time. As that district or that sort of notional district becomes increasingly Republican, the penalty paid by Arab senders increases until the point at which, um, in the most frequent uh, split here, uh, they're paying like the 16% penalty. What, what, could be, what could be leading to this, though, was a, sort of a question we were left with. Is the, is the reason that these response rates are different, is it implicit or is it explicit bias? And maybe the, this is sort of a specific term. Um, maybe the easiest way for me to think about it, I was listening to NPR the other day, and uh, uh, Henry Gates Jr., right, literary writer, uh, scholar at Harvard University. This is a famous story that sort of got bungled by the, by the presidents, by President Obama. Uh, Harry Gates Jr. was coming back from Hawaii. He and his limousine driver were trying to get into his house. The house was stuck. The, the door on the house was stuck. So he and his driver kicked the door in. Uh, a neighbor called the police. The police showed up, uh, and the police arrested Harry Gates Jr. despite having identification in his house. Later on, President Obama goes, this is like a hot moment for racial relations. I think that the white police officer and the, the black person who had been arrested, Gates Jr., should get together and have a beer. And there was a, a lot of conversation about this. So Gates Jr. is talking on NPR, and he says, you know, I realized that at the, at the time that I was arrested, the person who was arresting me was, was scared of what was going on, right? It was late at night. The phone call had come in that there were two men who were breaking into a house, and he had only found me, thinking that there was another man who was out there. And the fact that he didn't believe my identification, you know, I, I suppose perhaps that I understand that. This was, in the moment, this was implicit bias. He, he wasn't understanding that this was my house. If at the time that they had gone back to have the beer, right, five days later, if then the police officer had said, I still think that I did the right thing, I think that uh, you shouldn't have been in that house, that would have been explicit bias. So what we're coming to here, we have, I don't know, maybe a parallel setup. Does the individual open an email when the name on it is different, right? To the extent that they fail to open an email, that might be evidence of implicit bias. You just, I don't know this person, I don't know who this is, and so I just don't open it. If after you open the email and see the name, then there's discrimination, that probably would be evidence of explicit bias. You've actually primed higher order thought here. The individuals have said, I know the class or the ethnicity of this person, and I'm not going to respond. So here's what we've got as evidence of this. Uh, the first model on the tracker hits, this is the open rates. These are the, the trackers on did the registrar, the local elections official, open up the email. Uh, when a minority sent the email, it was about a 2.5% lower rate of open. And we can break into this and we can look, is it being driven by Latinos, is it being driven by blacks, or is it being driven by Arabs? It's, it's very clear that the pattern of minority non-openness is really occurring, non-opening, is really occurring among the Arab senders. And then in the, in the last of these models, so this would be evidence of implicit discrimination. I receive this email from a name that I don't recognize or that I don't understand or that I suspect maybe there isn't anybody with a name like this who lives in my area. I just don't open it. The second or the last of these models in column three here, this is did I get a response after having opened? So th this is a causal quantity. This is weird as a causal quantity, but it, it gives us information. So given that I did open it, then if I sent from a Latino versus a black versus an Arab compared to whites, what was the difference in the response rate? And at this point, Arabs are receiving a 10% penalty still, even if the registrar did open it. 
So we've got both implicit and explicit bias identified here. For the Latinos and for the blacks, right, we, we saw no discrimination against the black senders, so I'm not surprised we see nothing here. For the Latino cues, breaking out these mechanisms into one or another, it's, it's not clear that it is one or it is the other, which is leading to the overall pattern, so it's probably some of the both. If, um, if that were the, the long and the short of it, we, we'd have like a pretty open and shut um, experiment that had worked. Problem was that uh, the, the local elections officials are hardworking and they do their jobs and they figured out pretty quickly that someone else was running an experiment at the time and they started calling one another and sort of breaking our experiments on purpose because they said, look, <laughs> we're receiving a lot of emails from this email address. What's going on? Stop answering these. So we actually um, were covered in the nightly news in Denver, not us, but the, the other person. What happened is that another researcher um, had checked out an email sort of registry um, and s registered it in the exact same domain name as a previous study that had been run, the study that uh, we're replicating here. So when the registrars started getting a bunch of pings from uh, AJN Webmail, they said, hey, 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 last election we got a bunch from these folks and they were part of this experiment. We should not be responding to them. Now their webmasters are sort of digging through. They're looking for, are there other repeated sort of oddball email handles that we're getting from? And they started to pick us up in some of these states. So the, the question that's at hand is, did this cause problems for our experiment? I think the answer is no, but I want to present the results just to make sure that you believe it too. So here's the count. On the y-axis is the number, are the number of responses that we received. On the x-axis is the amount of time which has passed since we sent the email. And it, it looks actually really sensible, right? So we receive a ton of responses in the first 10 minutes of having sent. This is on a log scale here. A ton of responses within the first 10 minutes that we send. And then not much later that night when everybody's at home. The next morning we pick up another bump. Everybody's answering their emails in the morning when they get in. And then it's flattening out. Here's the beginning of the third day. There are some people who go three days back in email. I don't know who they are. I would like to shake their hand. They, there's a little push on response. The, the National Association of Secretaries of State sends out an edict that says, hey, there is an experiment which is going on. Probably don't respond to these people. And they send that out uh, here after we're done getting any differences in our response rates coming back. When we, when we break out the response rates by racial or ethnic condition, this is, just, this is data, not models here, uh, we can see here's the Arab prime. The, the discrimination against Arabs is, is visible in the first 10 minutes, right? Uh, it takes a little while longer because the effect is smaller for the discrimination against Latinos to become apparent, but it's apparent long before we have any sort of intervention by the secretaries of state. And the black senders um, are sort of, sort of piddling around the same response rate as the white senders the entire way through. We can, we can run models to check against this, um, and the models sort of back out what's happening here. It's not the NASS intervention that's leading to these responses. Uh, it really is the pattern of behavior among the registrars. Um, maybe, to, maybe to wrap up, given that we've seen this pattern of behavior, what, what could fix it, right? So we've got this causal effect, and the causal effect is that when the identity of a person is of a minority class compared to a white class. They get a different response rate. They get a different type of response from individuals. How can, I, I think that there's a norm that people who are eligible, eligible to vote should have access to vote, and that this is one of the ways that they sort of grab access. So what would we do to fix this? I think, I think an easy way would be uh, to implement what we saw in the Section 5 areas, where there's a very clear registrar at email address or a very clear web form that everybody has. In other areas, um, for example, Wisconsin, uh, the email addresses are personal email addresses or are like shared uh, spouse addresses that you're sending to. One of the registrars, one of the local elections officials email address was uh, quack quack boom at Gmail, right? <laughs> this person's a duck hunter, but they're using their personal address. And so then when that registrar changes over, 
I, I don't then know who to email next election. I have to go through the extensive search process again. And even little, little pieces like this, you know, they end up being costly. So we could use the first non-experimental part of it. The second, it's, it's not that hard. And a lot of folks around, a lot of hiring firms around here right now are doing work on this to hide the ethnicity or to hide the gender of applicants or to hide the gender or the ethnicity of uh, people requesting information to vote. If you were not able to identify the ethnicity of the person, you could not discriminate based on this. And so if we just had a, a form, if we had a system that was in place uh, at the level of the secretaries of state or the local elections officials, it would just preclude the possibility of this sort of differential treatment. And I think, you know, when we come back here to the, to the implicit bias, this 7% this penalty paid by Arabs right away, um, knowing a number of people who are local elections officials, it, this isn't probably intentional. This 7% this here, this is implicit and, and non-active. Uh, these folks really care about granting equal access. They're, they're in the job not for the money. They're in the job because they care about the, the democratic practice. And I think that we just need to do a little work to provide them more tools or training to, to do what they need to do. Uh, that's all I've got. Alex, this is Mike Rivera. I was wondering if you could uh, go into a little bit more how you guys validated the names and how, in fact, you verified that the names were queuing the race or ethnicity that you intended to. Yeah. So uh, we did it in a couple of ways. The first was that we drew from population lists that were um, sort of, they had ethnicity labels on them. And then we were drawing names that were not the most indicative of that. We didn't pull like Jonah Smith as a white name. But we went to like the, the, the center of the list. What we did then is we put it in front of Mechanical Turk workers. And we asked them to read the name on the email. And then we gave them a category of individuals. We gave them a, like a category boxing to put individuals in. And we said, do you think that this name, the person associated with this name is probably uh, white or black, Asian Pacific Islander, uh, Hispanic, Latino, and so on. And we had them give a probability distribution across all of those. Um, what we find is that a lot of the names we picked worked well. Some of the names were confusing. Uh, Xavier, people had no idea what to do with Xavier. Um, and you know, I would have been done really poorly at this task because I don't, I don't have priors on names that I think I'm aware of. But um, to the extent that they were confusing or not strongly signaling uh, races or ethnicities, that would just sort of pull away from our ability to detect an effect. So it could be the fact, it could be the fact that the, we're not seeing uh, a black versus white effect here because the names were not signaling black versus white strongly enough. But we're using a validated list that Fryer and Levitt put together that was able to generate discrimination in the past. This, this sort of leads me to believe that it's not that we weren't manipulating, but instead that there's been an open narrative about discrimination against blacks and that this open narrative and the training that's been run could be effective in reducing bias at that level. Thanks, Mike. Hi, my name is Ramel. Uh, I was just wondering what would you do differently in this kind of setup that's longitudinal? I mean, there aren't too many that I know of that have come through with such a strong result. Yeah. We actually, we thought about, and this is a little bit longitudinal, it's a little bit different, so let me know if I don't answer the question. We thought about following up with the local elections officials, so using like a within studies, a within subjects design where we sent them one category of uh, name, and then a week later sent them another of the categories of name, because that would give us a, like a really clean estimate. But given that we were getting found out and that people were, yeah, we decided not to do that, uh, breaking with our experimental protocol. Longitudinally, though, uh, what would we do? Uh, we replicated the design that was run in the 2012 election in the 2016 election. Is that the right number of years? Yeah, the 2016 election. So we were able to compare the Latino results then versus the Latino results now, generating two time-based estimates that are in the same direction, that are of about the same magnitude, and combine them together. So um, I don't think that we will be engaged in an audit study like this in the 2020 election, but I think that um, it, it could be possible. Thanks for a great talk. I, I, I 
very well, the clarity in your explanation of the experiment, I especially appreciate it. So you said, you, you looked at opening and you looked at reply, but you were not going to talk about the content of the replies. You said it was poorly causally identified. But I'm just curious, did you learn anything from the content of the replies? Yeah, we, we learned a lot from the content of the, of the replies. Um, some of the replies that came back asked, and this actually showed a lot of care on the part of the uh, local elections officials. They said, hey, um, Tom Johnson, I looked in the registry and I don't see you registered here. So you've got three days left to go before the window closes. Make sure that you, you get your stuff in. Um, that was actually the most common response that we received back from individuals was, I, I've checked. Uh, that, that was not the most common. The most common response was, you need to bring this and that and show up on election day. The second to most common was looking into uh, who the individual was and how to get them across the bar to be able to vote. Um, it was pretty uncommon that people emailed back and said, I don't think that you should have access or something strongly negative. And, and, and I think the reason that that is and the reason that it's not very well causally posed is that people who weren't people who were going to say something negative or going to say something xenophobic, if they were going to do that, they just weren't going to respond in the first place, right? You'd have to have a really strong negative feeling towards a person of this category to take the extra two minutes of your time to write them back. And we're not, the emails we're sending are not like Nigerian prince emails or like phishing, spear phishing emails. There's just, if you weren't gonna respond to this person, you were gonna say something strongly negative, you just weren't gonna send an email back. Thanks, Anna. So it was a great talk. Uh, just, I want to build on Anna's question. Insofar as your experiment was oriented around making inferences about the ethnicity of the names that were associated with these emails, were you able to make any inferences on the basis of the registrar names that came back to you in the responses? That's super clever. So we are working at that right now. The idea here being, what if what if the ethnicities of the registrars were different based on areas? So if I were a white registrar receiving a white name, was that different than if I were a black registrar receiving a white name? Um, that's a lot harder to do because, because the, the names of the registrars are incomplete. We, we had names about 60% of the registrars. For everybody else, we had emails. So we've been trying to build out more names. Uh, the second applying an, an ethnic label to a name is like a it's doable. It's a task. There are a bunch of classifiers that'll do this. It's a little bit noisy, too. And the third is that uh, just like a back of the envelope read through of this, the variation on it's not very, very high. Um, I think that my just glancing through the 6,000 folks, there may have been 20 people whose name would have immediately sounded like they were um, ethnically Arab to me. Uh, there were more blacks and Latinos, but it's, it's small. It's like maybe 5%, 5%, and then 90%. So I want to know that. I'm just worried the payout isn't there for the time. So, I mean, you could, maybe it would be useful enough just to know the overall distribution of the ethnicities of the street level bureaucrats, right? Like yeah. you could survey, you know, 10% of them and find out what the distribution is. And that might answer the question. Yeah. Like whether people, you know, I guess the hypothesis is that, you know, you're more likely to respond to somebody with the same uh, ethnic identity. Yeah. So if we, if we surveyed them, we came up with a distribution generally. I'm not sure that it's, uh, we need more information to set up the full test, right? We, we would actually, I think, probably have to have the ethnic or um, labels on all of the registrars to set up a test here. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be a causal relationship. Sure. You couldn't infer a causal relationship from that data, but um, I guess what you would expect is that there would be fewer Arab bureaucrats. Yeah. And yeah. that would suggest that the hypothesis is correct. But. Yeah. We'll do it. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> More work. That's all I've got. Oh. Can you talk a little bit about the bounces? I know you said it's only 4%, but I'm wondering if these kind of occurred in any systematic geographic way. Um, oh. Maybe they occurred in areas where they wanted to depress turnout by putting up an email that may or may not work. And that's yeah. a very pessimistic view, but maybe. 
No, I, I didn't take a look at that. After seeing the bounce rates here, I just, I just got frustrated and didn't look to see if there was anything that was predicting bounce rates. Let me look into that. My bet is that they're probably occurring in um, Michigan and Wisconsin, though, where we have like you know 40% of the registrars, and it's this like rapidly moving personal email address thing. Yeah. There are a couple of really neat papers written in the 90s about this group of people. Um, and I have, let's see, so my girlfriend's dad's wife worked in um, an election office. And, and they are so busy in election week. It, it's absolutely outrageous how busy they are putting things together, putting together the counts of the night of, and so on. But if the, if the state is not providing these individuals with an email handle or the opportunity to register a name at a, at a state level domain, what, what other option have they than to use a private email address? So the fact that uh, registrars, local elections officials in Wisconsin are all using personal email addresses, I don't think is a failing on their part. I think it's that the system's not providing them a common registry. And I would, I would I'm going to advocate to whoever will listen that we should do that. It's not very costly. No. So why are there more errors than bounces? Yeah. I don't know. Unlucky. So when we look for the tests on this, uh, we don't do any rejecting of a null hypothesis that this is different than whites or Latinos or blacks. So minorities are not different than whites. I think it's just, I think it's just unluckiness here. We talked with. Um, so this is, this is a hard bounce response. So this is someone who either has an auto reply away message up, which would be crazy the week before an election for a local election official to have that up. <laughs> I, or it's that they've given us the wrong address. These are not, these are not soft bounces where they're being categorized into spam or something else. Oh, we looked at the at the numbers. It's like it's like five in ten, four in ten. We're trying to get the first version of this through right now. It's at it's at uh, it's at the proceedings of the National Academies right now. It's gone through a couple of other rounds. We had it ready. We had it ready two weeks. That's not true. We had it ready a month after the election because we wanted to stay a part of the news cycle. We also didn't want to wear a bunch of publicity without it being peer reviewed um, because students who are on it. Um, and so it's been sort of trundling through a couple of different review cycles and it's, it's just missed twice. So what happens from here? Um, probably looking into the language inside of these. I think it's descriptively interesting. And um, yeah. Thanks, Tess.